talking about the pivotal role of architectural resiliency standards, service level objectives, and governments in scaling resilience in AWS Cloud. Woo! Thank God they're the experts and I am not. So just getting that out was a lot. We are joined by Carlos Rojas, Kate Blanchard, and Troy Koss from Capital One. Carlos is Vice President of Cloud Reliability Engineering and is responsible for driving a cultural shift toward balancing incident management and innovation with reliability engineering. For us, Carlos is a High Tech 100 awardee, a member of our corporate advisory board, and a mentor in the community. Carlos, thank you so much for all you do. We also welcome Kate Blanchard, Senior Director of Software Engineering at Capital One, who's helping to lead Capital One's Stability Engineering and Operations Organization and Cloud Productivity Engineering. And last but certainly not least, we welcome Troy Koss, who is Director of Enterprise Site uh -huh. Reliability Engineering, leading the Enterprise Site Reliability Engineering team. He plays a key part in involving enterprise strategy and leads a great team of engineers. Please give everyone a warm welcome. I will pass it over to you, Carlos. Thank you, thank you so much, Kelly. So good afternoon and welcome to our presentation about how to improve and scale the reliability of your systems. I promise by the end of this conversation, you're gonna be really excited and you're gonna sound very intelligent about some of the things that are going to impact every single company that we are part of. Um, also, thank you to our high tech partners for the opportunity to present. It's always a pleasure to elevate the community and especially on these engineering driven topics like reliability for your systems. Uh, with us today, Kate and Troy and I, uh, I think we have like 100 years of experience in this topic. So you're going to be, you know, well covered with lots and lots of data. Well, maybe 50. Let's just not say because that makes us, you know, look really old being here. Like old. Um, let's go to the next slide if you can. So, but imagine that you're watching your favorite TV show using one of your streaming services. We're not going to call names in here, but also imagine that you're trying to check your balance in your bank account and maybe even do a transfer to somebody else who needs money in your family. Or imagine that you're playing a game, a video game, uh, and you're in the middle of it, almost winning, right? Uh, and then boom, the movie freezes. You cannot do your transfer. You know what happened with your money. You lost the game because of latency maybe, and that move just, you couldn't react on time. And uh, how do you feel about that? Most likely not great. Um, probably you might even want to change your banking, your game. You're not going to play it again. And who knows, maybe you find a new streaming service. I think we all have gone through some of those scenarios at some point in time. And we know how frustrating this is, right? So today, really, we want to talk a little bit more about the why some of these things happen behind the scenes and how we can address some of those things for our companies so that our company is not in the news. Our company is not having some bad publicity or reputational damage because of some of the systems that, you know, basically had an issue. So with time now and with, with a new microservices architecture and cloud, things are getting more and more difficult to manage and to understand. There's more complexity everywhere. Um, we're, faced, we're faced with different pressures and different emerging technologies and different stacks. And in some cases, time is of the essence, right? And we need to move fast. And in some cases, we have to figure out how do we move fast without breaking the system? How, how do we move fast with more engineering and talent without necessarily investing all of the money into that one single application but net net, how do we do it, creating a fantastic customer experience for you know our customers? So when you think about that unreliability, it's kind of the enemy because that can jeopardize what's going on in your company with those services and systems. So let's explore the parachute of unreliability in the next slide. 
and talk a little bit more about you know what most people and most companies see in the surface and what really happens underneath. So we commonly know when something breaks. I gave you a few examples of that, right? Now, beyond only looking at the incident or at the latency or at the issue, uh, we have to proactively figure out what's underneath because that's where the potential for unreliability exists. And by the way, different companies look at different measures to figure out what the reliability of their systems are. Um, I like to say that you achieve reliability as you start thinking about how many nines you have in terms of your availability of those systems. And some companies can call it three nines, four nines, five nines. You can see in the example here, the differences. Now, what's tricky about it is the more nines you put in the mix, the more money you're spending. So really the question is what's good enough, right? And uh, let's say that money is not an issue, which I think that every company has that problem. Then your capacity must be dedicated to what's really important. So not every system, I'll tell you, in our case, we have thousands and thousands of applications. Not every application deserves the same amount of engineering and reliability effort behind the scenes. Why? Because it's more important for everyone to be able to log in and see your account versus maybe have a function that is used by 1% of the population or the customer base that you satisfy, right? So having that understanding of how do you balance reliability with cost and people is super important. Now, what are some of those things that cause unreliability? Lack of testing. Your engineering team develop a new feature. It's really cool because of the pressure to the market to go fast. We test it halfway through. That right there sounds like a win. You went through production, you deploy it, but at the same time it isn't because you can create a problem in production and your customers are going to be unhappy. That will be an unreliable experience, right? Um, let's say that your engineering team has to commit a command, uh, perform a task, execute a run book, and they have to always do it manually. That potentially is also another reason for unreliability because we're humans. We make mistakes. So whenever you have the chance to basically continue to automate, that's where you need to invest in those systems. If you have to do it more than once, it has to be automated. But some of these things are underneath, below the surface. And some of these things are the ones that come back later in, in, the, in the future and create an impact for our customers and for our company. Um, I'll give you one more example in here. Sometimes we test it correctly, we develop it correctly, we deploy it correctly, and we pray that it's going to be operational and working fine. And we don't have the right observability, monitoring, and alerting. So when something fails, we don't know how to react to it because we don't even have the right monitoring in place. So there are many different aspects of what we're trying to achieve for our systems to be reliable that we need to consider. Okay? So what practices can we follow to basically tackle this unreliability factor? Let's look at those. These are eight of the main buckets that we have identified and that we're investing heavily in our organization today. Uh, today, we'll look at some of these practice areas like resilient architectures, reliability measurements, continuous testing, which is super important, a, and a new expanding area within continuous testing, which is chaos engineering and risk management. All of these are critical to the successful strategy, you know, of having anchors and, and initiatives and areas of expertise within your organizations. But if you think about reliability, this is your commitment to your customer. If you think about total elimination, this is how we do more things with systems and automation versus with humans. If you think about incident response, it's not if it's going to fail, but when. Things fail, it will fail. Let's prepare for that one and have an incident response team that will allow us to get out of the problem really quickly, right? So now, how does that incident response team operate? It's based on the observability and the monitoring that you have in place. Otherwise, they're going to be flying blind. Now, risk management, this is a big one as well, because when you have thousands and thousands of applications, like I said before, 
which ones are the critical ones? You need to focus on the vulnerabilities, the capacity planning of those critical applications first, so that every other application will lead the way or will be implementing solutions and will be implementing capabilities based on how those critical applications are behaving, right? So those become the ones that lead, lead by example, the lighthouse projects that will drive everybody else in the company to have that higher level of reliability. Release engineering, if you deploy once every year, I'm sure you're packaging like a thousand changes in there. If you re release like 20 times a day, well, guess what? Smaller release is easier to control than a bigger release. Sometimes if you just deploy one change and it fails, now you know what failed. You know the root cause. You don't have to think about decomposing, decrypting what was the thing that broke the system because you just deploy one thing. And it's very simple at that point to restore it and fix it. Um, you have continuous testing. We've talked about it a little bit here. But really, how do we apply engineering to testing our systems? Not only before you deploy, but how do you test them in production? There's a new... Uh, area of expertise that is called chaos engineering. How do we apply some failure? How do we inject some failure to our system in production? And how do we control the outcome of that? It could be adding latency, adding error rates, removing components, figuring out dependencies, turning a whole region in AWS down with no access just to see how your systems behave. That's a big component that we're going to talk about as well today. And then Troy's going to take us to resilient architectures in a second. So this is a lot. Lots of practices, lots of different teams, right? So what makes really achieving these practices possible? And how do we integrate these practices in really the day-to-day -day of our organization? Well, our goal is holistically to be customer-obsessed, make sure that we put our customer commitments first, uh, to transform how teams basically operate. Uh, if the engineering team is working on this by themselves and they don't have the support of product or leadership, guess what? It is going to fail, right? Same thing with any of those four key elements. If you need leadership support, you need engineering support. You need the SRE or the cyber reliability engineering, which in some cases is called the operations team for some of your companies. And you have to have your product partners in there you know, working together with your teams. If you get buy-in from all of those teams, then it's easier to achieve reliability. I'll give you a healthy example of healthy tension that in some cases exists in companies. Product wants new features because that's what would satisfy the customers. Operations says things are breaking. We need to apply more time and dedication to remove technical debt and improve the stability of this system. Leadership have some revenue commitments. They want to go faster, but they don't want to break things in the middle of it. And the engineering team is caught up in the middle trying to figure out what they do. So some of the things that you're going to see today, when we have SLIs, service level indicators, SLOs, service level objectives, those are the ones that will help us have the right conversation between those four groups so that they are not only aligned as a one team, but they have some engineering driven metrics that allows them to make those decisions where to invest how much to invest where to accelerate development of new features where to slow down so that we can add more stability to those systems so incorporating the partnership of these four groups with your life cycle for development is the key to success um, so i'm going to hand it over to troy to dive deeper into some of this practice uh, troy And Troy, I think you are on mute. Well, you are still on mute. <laughs> there it is. So I got muted when everyone joined. Sorry about that. We can hear you now. Yes. All right. Fantastic. And you, need to, and you need to share the screen, I think, one more time, my friend. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for uh, teeing that up, Carlos. And I, I think a lot of just to resonate what you mentioned is there's a lot here, right? There's a lot to do. And we're going to explore a little bit on some of the key ones that we've been focusing on with resilience and measuring reliability uh, and continuous testing. So, so the, you know, Carlos mentioned, uh, you know, the, these eight focus areas. And the very first one is about being resilient. And right, I like to make the distinction between resilient and, and reliable 
uh, in that we want to we want to achieve reliability. We want to achieve that. And Kate will talk about that in a bit on on, on the the trust that we want from uh, we want to give our customers. But the resilience is really we know failure is going to happen. Carlos mentioned that that's inevitable. It's going to happen. But how do we respond when that happens? And how can we be able to rebound when when we do experience uh, pr problems and challenges within our systems? All right. Uh, so so what I would kind of boil it down to is understanding how your system responds, right, and copes with the surprises and the unknown and the things that are happening. Uh, a lot of you may have heard of and seen, right, active, active terminologies like that. Um, but the idea is you've got traffic coming into your system. And when something breaks in one area, you have to have the, the resilience to be able to survive and move yourself over into the other region, right? And that's a very simple and fundamental uh, use case of it. But there's more to to that resilient architecture. Uh, there's there's a lot of different practices that can be put into place uh, just to have you know the the buzzwords completed and the active active done, right? There's a lot of ways to do that, uh, and it doesn't really check all of the all of the uh, requirements to to truly be resilient. And there's a lot. Uh, what what I broke down here is really essentially some of the core ones though that that really will help anchor uh, you know the the reliability right um, when things go awry and and I'll st just talk a little bit about each of these briefly um, one thing immediately that comes to mind is infrastructure as code and really treating everything as code and and as we grow uh, from you know some folks may have worked on servers and uh, data centers and may still be in a data center and uh, have had uh, you know older systems that you know that that one server must stay up and must remain and must be there and if something happens to it right uh, you know the world comes crumbling down but now in the in the world of the cloud and we're moving to it we, we know that we can wipe it out and start over and rebuild but we have to define what that is that code or as code so that way we can trust it we can check it in we can treat it like code we can test it we can have pipelines around it. We can have the testing such that if something goes wrong, we can just redeploy it. We have our definition. We have our our, our uh, blueprint of, of how our system is built, um, declarative as code. Another another area is really you know in order to achieve that is having stateless applications, right? Uh, you can't have your application, your service. You can't log in and manually make a bunch of changes and come out because it creates unknown state, right? We don't know. Uh, who made the last change if, 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 if we're maintaining that state in our application. So it's, it's imperative that you, you really treat, you know, you may have heard of the pets versus cattle uh, kind of philosophy before, but really you, you want to treat your system not like a pet, not like a, a perfect thing, like cattle. Like it's just like we, 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 there's a lots of volume of it, right? Um, and it, it truthfully uh, prevents so much unknowns and uncertainty, um, which allows us to uh, respond when these incidents and, and challenges occur. Um, and, and, and a lot of what I'm describing is immutable infrastructure. It's it's keeping your stuff intact as designed, as your infrastructure designed it, as it's meant to be stateless, and, and leaving it alone until it needs to go away and come and spin back up. Um, a, a very common area for us is being able to, if something happens, go back to that previous state. So having the redundancy, like I mentioned in different regions, having the ability to roll back to a previous version and get back to normal, right? Uh, you deploy something, bad change, breaks something for our users. Well, how can we minimize the amount of time it takes us to go back to where we need to be so we can roll back, right? Uh, there are plenty of other uh, patterns here like scaling and growth, being able to respond to spikes in traffic, uh, but these are all really things that help us become resilient. Uh, moving ahead into another topic, right? Now that we've we've kind of established how we build our systems and how we can build them re re resiliently, how can we ensure that they're actually working? Like Carlos said earlier, how do we how do we def definitively say, no questions asked, it's working, and it's and it's working well, and how well is it working? Uh, the way that we've historically, you know, looked at systems is as long as it's up and working, we're good to go. But we know that that's not true, right? Uh, there's varying levels of things that impact our customer, right? And it may not mean the whole system is down, but it may mean a capability is not working. It may mean that it's really slow. Uh, and these are different uh, different customer impacting scenarios that we have to measure for and make sure our system is really responding the way it needs to be. So 
changing the way we measure, it, a lot of it has to do with, again, providing more context than it's up or it's down. That's the really shifts, right? It's, it's how good is it working? How well are we working, all right? Using this data to drive our priorities, to drive our decisioning, where do we need to spend our effort? Carlos brought up uh, cost earlier, and that's a very important part. I'm sure a lot of you have fe felt in the past, there's too much to do, there's too many vulnerabilities to fix, there's too many systems to upgrade, there's too many deployments to be made, and where do I need to spend my effort? Where do I need to really focus in on? And it's, it helps us look at the things that are the most read and drive those uh, fixes to make sure that they're working appropriately. Um, there's so much growth, as you mentioned as well, uh, that we need to understand how our systems around us are operating. So having transparency to how they're being measured um, and, and ultimately, again, moving towards our customer need. Um, and this helps us, again, create a shift from being reactive to, to more proactive. Um, you may have heard these terminologies before, but just as they've been coming up, right, as, uh, so the indicator, the metric, the things that we are looking at, how many good transactions do we have over, over total, good being defined as you need, right? It's fast enough. It's it's available, right? Um, it's the correct data that comes back to me. And then setting objectives, being accountable, uh, understanding how your system needs needs to perform that's good enough to meet your customer. Joe's reporting app doesn't need to be five nines of reliability, right? But logging into your bank app and being able to see it might need that level of availability to it. Um, and, and what this really gives us is if we, if we look at the amount of error that we have in our system, we can budget that error. And as long as we're achieving that, we're good to go, right? And we can observe how much error we have remaining in our budget uh, to, over time to tell us stuff, to give us signals, to see if we're trending in the wrong direction, right? A lot of teams uh, tend to focus on the alerts when something goes wrong, signal all the alarms, jump on. And that is a big part of reliability engineering. Like Carlos mentioned, there's event, event and incident response and there's other pieces. However, if we take our, our mind, instead of looking at 30 minute windows, 20 minute windows, 10 minute windows, five minute windows, and, and, and smaller to say there's a spike in errors, a spike in problem. And we look back at our system over a large 30 day window or a large time like a, this, if we're looking at uh, this example here, we can see the patterns and trends and fluctuations. We can see where we've introduced change and things start to degrade after the change. And we can catch them earlier and prevent those large giant incidents of fall off where our amount of error that we can withstand falls right off. Detroit, so the, let, me, let me add a quick comment in here. Um, sure. This graph seems to be geeky and everything, but hey, it is important to realize that with the metrics on the previous slide or this visualization of those metrics, right? And the combination of that and cloud nowadays, it really, it's really possible, very possible to achieve any level of reliability that you need for your company. Some examples of that include, hey, I only use one region in you know, my cloud provider. Well, guess what? I'm seeing that there's latency or issues or degradation of service in the West Coast and my region is in the East Coast. So maybe the solution is to add another region. Maybe, you know what? The availability of the system is great. Everybody can access the system, but the experience is not fantastic because there's latency. It takes three seconds, five seconds to open that you know, particular window or that mobile application or you gaming again, to my example at the beginning, is slow and you, you end up losing the game because of that. Well, maybe as, as a company who cares about customers and leverages technology, that's your opportunity to say, hey, am I able to auto scale and increase the capacity that I'm offering to my customers? Am I able to create a new local zone that is close in relationship to that geography so that my customers don't have to wait for three seconds? They have to wait for three milliseconds or less than that, right? So th this is where we start playing with what is the data telling us and what are the resilient architecture, you know, the opportunities on that resilient architecture possible for us to invest in, right? So just trying to connect that information with the initial example of, you know, can stream correctly, can see your bank account. Maybe these are some of the reasons why people are not looking, companies are not looking at different metrics and different alternatives. Back to you, Troy. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and, and took a moment to, to reflect on it because a, a lot of times the things we put in place, the resilience we add, we have to, ensure that it's working, right? Like if we if we decide to add another region, 
maybe we've introduced extra latency and now maybe our system's going to perform slower, right? And these are these are opportunities for us to keep a pulse on the resilience that we're bringing to our system. Is it achieving the goal of ultimate reliability that we needed? Um, adopting something like these measures is not easy. I will come out and just tell you straightforward is not the easiest thing in the world. However, right, you have to have the tenacity and to continue in perseverance to unlock these metrics. So you you have this visibility, you have these eyes, these these metrics, the the dashboard to your car, right, uh, and understanding that you know how much gas you got left in the tank, right, and and there's different ways you can look at this, but there's really a, a part of adoption growth that people understand what they are, they learn how to define them, and then there's the integration. It's like we're following the policy, we're using this data in our in our conversations. Uh, someone like Carlos is using it at an organizational level to help plan capacity, to plan focus, pl resource staffing, right? How do we grow our team? How do we grow our enterprise or org, right? Uh, a team is using it to say, how did that feature affect us, right? Um, where are we at? Do we not have a lot of budget left? We probably should stop releasing features and now we need to think about more resilience or improving our system, our release engineering or improving our, our app, right? That integration is the real hard part, but as long as you kind of keep along both of them and just begin starting with something, right? You can grow into adoption and you can grow into the integration and then have these for your enterprise as the destination to, to make these decisions, right? And 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 help help make data-driven decisions on, on what you want to do with your within your respective teams and organizations. And the hardest part is getting started on anything. Right, it's like, it's, okay, and then what? What do I do? How do I get going? And and the real thing here is not to overcomplicate it. Make it simple. Uh, one of the biggest things I can recommend is starting with the simple things that people understand. They understand HTTP codes, they have 500's bad response codes or anything less is good, right? Start with simple, uh, don't overcomplicate it. There's edge cases, of course, but just measure your traffic. Just measure it and start looking at your SLIs and look at, you, look at your data, learn it, right? Empower the engineers, empower yourselves to, to have that data. Then start dissecting your app, understanding the different layers, the edges, the APIs, the client. You know, where do we need to get metrics? Where do we need data uh, to, to get more accurate uh, representation of the user? And then uh, how do we how do we map edge cases? And then eventually measuring our customer's experience, right? How do we look at these critical business transactions and start measuring them? And this process never ends, right? It keeps going. Uh, and when you're doing this, make sure that you don't set your targets at 100 because as Carlos mentioned again, it's bound to, to have a problem it's not realistic. Not, right <laughs> is not real so so the last section we're going to look at really quick here is the is the continuous testing and and the chaos engineering in particular um and and it's it is an emerging topic because the the dynamic complexity of everything that's going on in the world around us is is getting too hard to comprehend as engineering teams i'm sure you feel like like at sometimes, wow, there's 10,000 services and they're all talking to each other and there's this many logs and this data is up. But CAS engineering can really un unlock the ability to prove that our, our system is resilient as well and, and test our hypothesis. It's CAS engineering is not breaking stuff. It's not shutting off something and seeing what happens, right? It's saying, if I do shut something off, I expect something to happen, right? And proving that that happens. So this is kind of a logical flow of how you think about it. You have your steady state, how your system's performing, you design cast experiments, uh, you know, Carlos, we, we, we've seen before uh, where we have a big incident, we have a problem happen, uh, certification expiring, uh, changing in our instance type sizes and something breaks, right? These become good opportunities for us to make experiments to say, if we fix the problem, maybe we should prove that it works with an experiment all the time and run it in production, right? And uh, being able to test that fault, that, that, that problem over and over again um, and tying it back to SLOs, right? If you have the measurement of how your system performs, you have these boundaries, you have these safety, these safety bounds where you can say, okay, we know that we can test, we can experiment, we can inject latency because we're within our objective. We're, we're meeting our objective. Let's continue to experiment. Let's inject more, a little bit more. Okay. How much can our system like really take, we think it can go 200 milliseconds. We think it can go one, it can handle 300 milliseconds. Like what is the delay before the timeouts and things start occurring? Um, so it really helps us uh, provide boundaries um, using those metrics we talked before. And I think the the real thing before I hand it over to Kate is, uh, is all this is related, all this is connected, right? We've got these eight practice areas and they're all related to each other. 
And I don't think one is more important than the other. I think it's, it's collective that they're all part of our system, as part of our culture um, for our people, our processes, and, and ultimately our systems. Hey, Troy, so, I think that, you know, the challenge as we uh, speak about chaos engineering as being one of the most uh, innovative and recent practices that we have, again, I guess the challenge for everyone in this call is if you are responsible in some way or fashion for reliability of your systems, ask yourself, why am I not comfortable, you know, adding failure or injecting failure in my production systems or in my systems? And that's a, that's a really powerful question, right? Go through the five whys and figure out why you're not doing it because it's a really good practice. Now, if you're not responsible for this reliability um, area in your organization, you might want to go back and ask those SRE teams or operations teams to say, are we introducing any failure intentionally to our systems to see how we behave and respond to those things? Because that's the, that's the practice that is most difficult to achieve, but at the same time, if you do it and you do it well, is the most rewarding part of it because it'll tell you so much. In our case, we have mitigated incidents from happening in production because we have found those things earlier than our customers have. And it's just that simple. If you don't invest in it, your customer will gonna, is going to notice. It's not that it's not going to fail. It will fail, but I'd rather find the failures in my systems with my team versus my customers, right? So that's the power of what we're trying to present to you today. Uh, back to you, Kate. All right, awesome. Thanks both of you, Troy and Carlos. Uh, I can't echo uh, my feelings about chaos engineering louder. That's one of my favorite topics and it is the most, uh, I guess, valuable way to really drive reliability, but it, it is also the, one of the most advanced um, SRE practice areas. So it's difficult to get there. So if you're not there right at the beginning, that's okay. There's lots of other things to focus on first. Um, but the last topic I'm going to talk about today is risk management and how might risk and security be fundamental to reliability. Let's start by taking a close look at the word reliability and its definition. It is the quality of being trustworthy and performant and accurate. Trust is currency of reliability. Trust is how you get and keep your customers. So what is the opposite? I'll go back to our iceberg uh, graphic that Carlos showed at the beginning. Unreliability is our old enemy. The lack of being trustworthy, not performing well, not being dependable, or being doubtworthy. So if unreliability is a risk, which erodes trust, then, and trust is the currency of reliability, then it makes sense that you would want to manage your risk in order to achieve reliability. For example, availability is a cornerstone of reliability. The first key component to measuring your reliability, I would say, and then that can inform your appetite for risk. Your risk appetite is basically your measure of how much trust currency you're going to fight to keep or defend from losing. Uh, you know, I just, I only mentioned availability first because it is one of the biggest, most important ways to measure, but it isn't the only one for sure. A few others have been touched on um, by Carlos and Troy so far, but managing and being aware of risks, whether they're categorized as cyber risk or change or capacity or risk to resilience, it's, it's such an important practice area this includes timely remediation of security vulnerabilities, planning for capacity and doing chaos tests against that capacity, as well as having the governance and standards in place around all of those activities, it's not just one, one standard, it's many different standards. And what standards and governance allows you to do is intentionally manage that flow of trust currency. So Troy talked a bit about how we're changing, how we measure customer experience to be more inclusive, not only at times of war when we are having an incident, but also in times of peace when there's still low level disturbances that are going unnoticed. What we're trying to do is really take the guesswork out of technology by intentionally managing that flow of trust. We don't 
need to guess what our customers are feeling about our application. We, we don't only find their pain when it's too late and there's a serious problem and they're mad at us. We can know how they feel because we're actively measuring it in all these categories of ways. And we have stated through governance and uh, standards what is acceptable risk. And again, it's not 100% that we're, we're not aiming at 0% trust loss, but we're aiming at an acceptable level of risk that we know good enough means for our customers. So we're on our way to being winners at Capital One, I think. And we hope we shared a lot of tips with you. Um, we feel like we've got the foundations built, but we are no, by no means finished. Uh, to continue winning, we have to go all the way, enable more reliability and deeper practice areas and level up our maturity for all of the groups of people who are building and running customer experiences at Capital One. We want to be better and more trustworthy than every other bank. But by measuring the customer experience, we're using a common language across all of these different teams of people, developers, product, and business. And this allows us to do that like cultural alignment between tech and, and the business strategy. So we're pretty far into time. I want to make sure we have time for um, questions. So I'll conclude, uh, we'll recap a little bit. Growing complexity and unreliability will create a competitive disadvantage for companies. Incidents are just the tip of the iceberg and are usually indicative of underlying reliability. Our recommendation is to anchor on like a set of reliability engineering practice areas. They don't have to be the same as ours. You should figure out what they are for SRE for your company. It might be very sim similar, but um, there tends to be nuances between different corporations. But it allows a, a measurement of the maturity of reliability practices at your company and also offers like bite-sized spaces to allow focused efforts and areas of expertise, because otherwise this is overwhelming. However many, I call them the facets of reliability engineering. Um, our immediate focus has been on measuring and actioning on reliability practice areas, um, but it's also important to be intentional on how you're managing that currency of trust with standards and governance. Um, next up for us, we will continue to anchor on the measurements of health for our customer from our customer perspective. Uh, and we're going to solidify an, an enterprise agreed upon inventory of customer journeys uh, and their, the definition of reliability, their measurement of reliability. Uh, we will augment and evolve our current processes to include additional reliability measures as we find them. Um, but I really think starting with availability and latency is a fantastic, straightforward way to start. Um, and we want to include more than just incident counts in measuring the success, We're adding SLOs and error budgets and capturing the entire customer experience. Um, we, we're trying to change the culture so that reliability is recognized as a feature of software that we build and that we have shared ownership between reliability engineering product and the business. And we all have a say in what good enough looks like. And it's not 100%. I think we all agree on that. And finally, we aim to provide all of our partners with really clear counsel on actionable steps when um, in areas where we, we, we can remove unreliability for the team. So that's our conclusion. Thank you for joining us. And now we'll have Q&A. So I'll hand it back. Great job, everyone. Um, Al, I will uh, let you take the mic. You are on mute. Oh. Al, we can't hear you. The teams need a uh, more resilient uh, microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We need to inject some failure into this and see what comes out of it. <laughs> right. There you go. Love. Kelly was listening. <laughs> Kelly, you're hiding. I was listening, <laughs> taking notes. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Vic. Can you hear me? 
Yes. yes. Um, it's a great presentation. You know, we actually just presented something to to our management yesterday morning, um, and uh, we, you know, we were presenting the same concepts, the same, you know, different priorities between Dev and PO and SREs. Um, the question I is how how far into the journey are you in terms of error budgets and adopting, and how and if you are, are are Dev and PO sticking to you know. The negotiation numbers, like if if they have if they have negotiated a number and they've breached a number, do they like pencils down and work with you to uh, fix the issue, um, or they um, you get some pushback? It's a great question. I think Troy is dying to answer that one. I'll give you a thirty second <laughs> update. Um, we have defined a maturity level for SLOs and SLIs with four different levels. We are right now at level one point five which okay. is we have default SLOs, SLIs. Uh, we want to get to level four, which is basically a policy that helps us with decisioning on what we do from a product operation, a leadership point of view, and having that conversation being automated. But hey, Troy, back to you. You have better yeah, answers you know, in there. It's a, it's a great question. It's loaded too uh, in that, like, <laughs> It depends on the team, right? We've seen different maturities of different teams. Uh, and, and I think it varies. I think it's okay that it varies. And like Carlos mentioned, we really needed to, more recently it was a good idea to anchor to kind of what does maturity look like in the LSLO space. You've got the defaults and the basic, the foundational pieces. Um, but I, I will I will say as the, that is a simple piece and that is as a first step, it is probably the most important in that it gives you the eyes to your system, right? Otherwise, we're driving around blind. We don't know where we're, we're going. And the power in just showing a team their traffic of all of their load balancers averaged together over time is immense. It's it's super powerful. Um, and then the objective, setting the actual target, uh, is something that can come up later, right? <laughs> Step one is just look at your data, see where it's at, baseline, yeah. understand it. Um, and I think we were so afraid for such a long time of – like, what should the objective be? Who's going to set the number? Set the number. Tell me what the number is. And nobody had the answer. And uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't help the conversation. Say, well, here's where you're at. Where do you want to go? Uh, Let's go there. I'll tell you one more thing, Big. Um, a great sign of progress is that, so we are the enterprise history team for Capital One. We, we support and work and partner with different lines of business or products or companies within the company, right? Like automotive, the retail bank, the consumer bank, the credit card company. They, these are different groups that they have their own SRE teams. What I can tell you is that once phase one was in place with default SLIs, we got everyone's attention. Now we got the DCIOs of different companies calling and saying, hey, I want to know more about how my the organization looks like on. based yeah. on this. So now, now our concern, and Kate can relate to this one, our concern is how are we going to be able to support all of the demand and all of the conversations we have because this thing just got on fire. So mm -hmm. it's just building that initial default SLI, SLO conversation, proving and earning the trust, just like Kate said. And then just brace for impact because everybody wants it. Yeah, you know, we, we have we have experienced the same. I mean, people love the conversation, people want to see the data, uh, getting getting to the fact that this is the number and let's stick to this number. And if we breach that number, then you know, pencils down and we should we should work on it. So it's always a struggle. Like the 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 chart you are or the pick you had with the with the rock. I mean, I I honestly just you guys made my day. That those <laughs> Great presentation. Great presentation. Love to hear Thank that. you so much. Appreciate it. Al, you back in business? I, I am. I mean, I, I think Vic, uh, I had Vic, Vic is part of my team, so he asked a question. The thing I would just, maybe this is more of a comment than a question. Um, we, you know, within our wealth management business and including a bank, actually, Vic, Vic is the SRE sort of executive that, that supports our bank. The key thing for us is, you know, having the SLIs, SLOs, like like you guys have done at Capital One, but also having the governance process in place so that when 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 there's breachment, right, when and of those SLIs, SLOs, we need to make sure that there's no, you know, no deals going on around what are we going to allow in, into production. So I'm curious on like what work have you guys done? around defining sort of the policy, the governance process, so that people are, are adhering to the SLIs and SLOs and sort of the thresholds that you guys have defined.
but making sure that from a release engineering or release management, if, if you got a particular application, let's say the credit card business, they've reached their SLIs and SLOs, nothing is going into production unless it's a break fix to bring down and, and, and obviously fix an, any production issues. Got it, good point. I think there are many proactive measures that, that we're taking. Um, reporting and having the conversation is the first thing, right? But also when we see that there's consistency in error rates or you know, burning through your budgets, with a given application, um, if we see that those applications use automated controls or automated pipelines, we kind of uh, revoke is a strong word, but we suggest that these applications go through a manual CAB process where there's a manual review of what they're deploying, right? So that way it forces like the second, third pair of eyes when something's going out to production because we, again, it's, it's we're in the business of trust and creating that currency matters. And not only the SRE team needs to create that, but the application team needs to come up and say, I'm confident, and this is what I'm gonna deploy. So that's one way that we do in a manual fashion to yep. basically be able to achieve it. Our goal though, is to be able to integrate some of these SLOs with an automated pipeline so that the system is actually telling the team directly that you breached your SLO and you cannot deploy automatically. So yeah. that's kind of like the next step in there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, Thank you. Describing, he, uh, he mentioned we're on level 1.5. So error budget policies are at level three. So you start with the default SLIs and you, you get you dip code into the, the pond and then you get customized SLIs and SLOs. Then you define your error budget policy, which says when my error budget is exhausted to 25%, for example, I'm going to do this. And you set up a chain. So maybe it's alert like people need to know see something say something right they need to be aware maybe it is negotiated that they can't do any more releases until they've uh addressed their their problems so those are all on the table but it needs to be pretty flexible like that negotiation between product and engineering and business to say what the policy is and then what happens when they violate the policy yeah from a from an implementation or more tactical perspective i think Taking that one step further is if we make a document that says my error budget is this and when it does it gets to this level, we're going to do X doesn't work. <laughs> I forewarning you, don't do that. Like it, it'll work for the <laughs> moment, but then it, it dies. Right. Um, and if, if it's not systematically driven, it's not going to work. And what Carlos and, and Kate were alluding to is the integration of it into our processes and our pipelines, like when you go to release. If your error budget's below value, the button doesn't literally work until you get approval by someone else, right? Or, or there's a reason, or there's a, an evidence that says um, what we're, what we're, my teams are working on developing is kind of a, uh, almost like a domain-specific language for error budget policy. Um, it's something we might even open source, but to really describe what an error budget policy is in terms of like code, like a YAML definition or something, right? So that teams could. It's irrefutable, and we can systematically drive the policy uh, in, in in different places. So, um, yep. for those for those yeah. that want to nerd out, that I mean, that, that's great feedback. You know, appreciate it. And I mean, irrespective of having, let's say, the the error budget policy, I think you know one of the key things we've seen is is having, you know, the the guidance or the support from our leadership, right, from both on the technology side and on the business side. So our CIO who's my direct boss, you know, he's looking at metrics all the time that if, if he sees that a particular area is hot and they're running into issues, um, at least we, we have, you know, he's got our back that if we push back on that particular application development team to go fix their code, we, we know that obviously the, our leadership provides sort of that, that, um, that support we need, right? So I think it's a combination or, right? yeah, you can have formal <laughs> policies but having sort of changing that culture, as you guys mentioned, and having the support from the business on both on both you know the tech side and the business side is is really key. Hey, I'll I'll share one more comment and then we'll we'll hand it over to Pablo uh, Salazar. I think it's also important not only to highlight the opportunities and the problems, but also to engage with the teams. And one thing that Troy has done with Kate in our organization is to surgically pick which which are the applications that have more relevance and 
where we need to basically go on, you know, be hands-on with the team to help them resolve it. Um, what I keep telling my team is, let's not be the fire, you know, the, the, the police officer giving tickets saying, you haven't done this, you need to do that. And let's become the paramedic. Let's just go in and work with them, help them put the oxygen masks so they can survive and they can, they can get better, right? Help them with the get well plan, not only from the outside, but in the trenches with them. So some of those things are hard, of, of course, because of the cost and the capacity constraints, but it is what it is. So that's the option. Hey, Pablo, I want to take you know your question as well. Go ahead. <laughs> there, thanks. Uh, by the way, first, a great presentation it was very enlightening. And I wanted to ask about kind of the culture side, especially between the, the slide you mentioned about having different teams, especially operational SRE compared to the software teams. How and where do the responsibilities lie on? Like who owns the SLIs and SLOs? Who defines them? Who implements them? And where are kind of that, that, that trade off? And also on the chaos, chaos engineering, like is the allocation team by themselves? Do they have a, a team from SRE that jumps in and do the chaos engineering with them? Like how that culturally works for you? It's a partnership and it's a phenomenal question. And it's a very difficult one because you cannot help every single team in your company when you have 15,000 engineers. How do you distribute your centralized SRE across, right? It's hard. Um, so our enterprise SRE team is responsible for, responsible for the community of practice, the tooling, the engagement with the application teams. But we, we're focusing on the you build it, you own it model where each application team is responsible for it versus our SRE team in the enterprise becoming a crutch that is always trying to help and do on behalf of. We're trying to elevate the team to say, we we'll give you the tools, we teach you how to fish, you go and do it on your own, right? It's really hard. It sounds like almost like cheesy, right? But it's really hard. But I think the idea is in which cases you go in and you participate with them hands-on, in which cases you don't do that, but you give them the practices and the tooling, in which cases you create new features for your SLIs, SLOs, and your tooling in partnership with those teams. So it's a combination of them, but I think the most important part is what Kate was saying, trust is your currency. You have to enable the company to trust that what you're doing is on you know, behalf of the company for the better of the company. Kate, Troy, any comments on that? Uh, I, I'm curious what Kate's thoughts are on the chaos part, the chaos question that they had uh, in terms of Who's assigning them? I, I, and it's it's unfortunate, but most of the time it's the it's the engineering and development teams that are defining it. Um, that because they're responsible if it breaks. <laughs> um, but what we're trying to push a lot more for is the product team involvement, right? And and that shared ownership model um, where we see things work the most. Some of our partners and our and um, some of our most critical like apps like the Capital One Mobile and Web and stuff like that are product partners are actively part of the conversation they are looking at what we need they're saying no if it drops below this customers get really mad <laughs> like and like we have that real connectivity it's not you know so it, i think it's, it should be a shared target setting and everyone agrees to the setting uh and that's that goes back to the common language that um kate mentioned right is what do we all agree on is is good enough for the customer for x you know objective so i'll, I'll turn it over to kate to answer kind of your, your chaos question yeah, so I think your question was kind of along the line of how how do we do chaos at Capital One tactically? There is a crew um, in a team that does it focuses on chaos engineering, and we do many kinds of chaos engineering from very very large regulated uh, like enterprise wide regional isolation failover tests where everyone's participating and there's credit and there's standards and there's regulation. It's like, it's like Titanic, it's that kind. Smaller size uh, where it's maybe just a handful of applications or just specific components. And again, it's that it's all based on that hypothesis. We're not just doing this to break stuff in production. Like we're testing a hypothesis. Maybe the hypothesis is everyone at Capital One can run in one region for three hours without dying, like without, with no major incident. Right? So that's one hypothesis. Another one might be my application can withstand one or two or three availability zone outages. And then you test that and understand like that's a game day size test. So we also have different tests for uh, data 
uh, durability and failover uh, and availability because that's a little bit slower, harder, that you're moving large amounts of information um, potentially. So we're, we're not finished. We're undergoing sort of an evolution to unify how we do chaos um, and make it very easy for engineers to implement. We're trying to move toward continuous testing. So we're not there yet, but we're trying to set up the automation, the tooling, the culture, the mindset to be running tests against production constantly, including tests that will validate our SLI measurements and things like that. So there's a whole different talk we could do about that for a whole hour. So <laughs> thank you very much. Great question. Are those, we probably have room for one more question if anyone in the audience has one. And if not, I'd like to pose this. Um, so where do you see the future of reliability engineering with the emergence of generative AI and ML? That's a good one. Uh, I'll take that one. I'm curious, again, what your thoughts are. But, um, you know, I, I've been asked this question before uh, more recently. It, it's, you know, the emergence of something cool and flashy like AI and everyone's like, all right, how does this apply to my world? Um, and what I think it will help do is like, if we can collect the data, right, that we have for the SLIs in those days, and we have the signals and the data and like what's going on in the data, and we have the understanding of how our system is defined, if we do it as code, infrastructure as code, and we have it very clearly articulated how it's the system is deployed and running. I do think there's an opportunity to interpret that data to help us, step one, have it tell us what's going on, like ha have it inform us on where we're seeing the, the slow burns, where are we seeing the degradation in performance? Uh, and then if we have the, the letter, which is the architecture piece, I think you could almost trigger a lot of events to happen uh, on demand, right? Like, where do you see the biggest problem? Okay, I see that this service has dropped its availability by X percent over the past week you know, something's going on or maybe in the past hour. Uh, and then you could say, OK, can you fail over region for me? And then it'll go check and it'll say, oh, yeah, sure. You want to do this? And then it'll do it for you. Right. I think making it more conversational and, and using using it could be a place for generative AI in, in the space. But a lot has to be done yet <laughs> to do that. Yeah, to get we're, there's a long road ahead to, to get to like quality AI and the capability. Troy was talking about the, the basis of that is really solid data. You have to have very clean data that is well understood. And then the generative part of it, I guess, making more data out of that data. Um, but and then taking action off of it that or maybe giving advice to humans might be a good place to start. Like we want to counsel them on if we see this sort of pattern in their data, then they should do this thing about this specific thing. So it takes some more of that guesswork out of it, but that's a long way. We have a lot of work to do to get there for sure. Yeah, yeah. Our, a, a, a colleague of mine uh, had said, well, those those that re require can't inspire or something to that effect, right? So our goal is to inspire people, not to require them to do so, um, and to get them to take that accountability, ownership, and understanding of how their system uh, is behaving to be reliable. So the SRE way. No. Love that quote. Well, on behalf of High Tech, I want to thank Kate, Troy, and Carlos for leading this truly informative discussion. I think there were a lot of takeaways um, that myself and the audience can walk away with. Um, particularly on that testing um, can really lead to reliability of your systems. And that, you know, there's no harm in injecting failure to see kind of where you're going wrong. And so I think for me, I'm uh, excited to walk away with some learnings. I know Carlos, our data guy, will probably be annoyed by me asking my own questions of him uh, later on today. Um, but thank you all. And I hope to see many of you um, in person at our High Tech Fall Leadership Summit 
which is uh, unbelievably only 18 days away. So thank you all so much to Capital One. We appreciate um, your partnership and look forward to continuing to work with you all. Thank you and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.